Congress in Washington, D.C. may be about to vote on an assault weapons ban. What is going on here? What other gun control measures are coming up? My name is Tom Grieve, former state criminal prosecutor, criminal defense attorney. Guys, let's get into it. So if you've not already seen our video where we're talking about House Joint Resolution 44, where the Republicans were able to successfully pass out of the House by a vote of 219 to 210, a bill that would effectively repeal the ATF's pistol brace rule, check that out in the description box below. The Democratic Party is not very happy about the fact that the Republicans were able to successfully pass out of the House by the vote of 219 to 210 back on June 13th, 2023. The bill that would ostensibly repeal the pistol brace rule passed by the ATF. In response to that, they're trying to do three things, and how they're trying to do it is kind of interesting through something called the discharge petition. But first, those three things. Number one, another assault weapons ban in AWB. You knew this was going to happen, and it keeps coming up. It's seemingly every single session of Congress. So this one's aiming to do, among other things, prohibit the sale, transfer, manufacture, and importation of semi-automatic weapons and magazines that can hold 15 rounds or more. Now, a lot of these details are a little bit fuzzy. If you want me to be following up on this to see exactly what the details are, be sure to let me know in the comment field below. But otherwise, it's worth noting that, of course, we're going for the prohibiting of the sale, transfer, manufacturing, importation. So seemingly, there would be no confiscation with the way that this is worded. And I'm not saying, therefore, it's great. Let me be clear, comment section. But my point in all this is there also seems to be maybe a grandfathering provision, but there's also nothing that would allow then, say, for instance, if I had AR-15s, hypothetically pre-boating accident, and then I were to pass away someday, get hit by the bus, there's nothing that would allow this to then transfer to someone else. It looks like that, if I had to guess how this is worded, that's the point of confiscation that would come in. Probably the same for magazines as well, if I had to guess. And of course, we did a video talking about the legal attack, the playbook of what's going on to attack the Second Amendment, all these different points. So be sure to check that out on our channel as well. Number two, the Bipartisan Background Checks Act. This is an act that would institute near universal background checks for gun sales, with exceptions for family transfers and temporary hunting transfers. Okay, what's going on here? Well, let's just remember, quick history lesson, that all, of course, firearm registrations, and of course, registrations is the prerequisite to confiscation and ban, have to basically start with some sort of universal background check or something like that. We need some sort of way of knowing where all the guns are and who has them. This is the reason why historically pro-gun forces, whether Democrat or Republican, have been so incredibly resistant to the idea of bipartisan background checks and all this other kind of stuff. Okay. I'll also note for you that it's not like a lack of background checks is posing a huge problem. If you look at all the different ways that criminals are actually obtaining firearms, generally they're stolen, they're purchasing them off the street or through some sort of black underground market. If you really think that the person who's trying to, you know, the 19 year old drug dealer uh, is going to, you know, be afraid of purchasing something off the street, I don't really know what to tell you. I also read a really interesting study that actually goes into all these kind of underground markets. If you want to see me talk about that, also, of course, be sure to let me know in the comment section below. But the bottom line to this is, look, you talk about the so-called gun show loophole, something that, of course, many politicians love to run on. As a note, less than 1% of so-called gun crime, in other words, crime that is committed in one way, shape, or form with a firearm, less than 1% of crime involves a firearm source from what appears to be have come from a gun show. And if you think that that number is going up, it's actually going down. The number from these days is actually almost half or less from what they were 20 years ago or so back in the 90s. So we see a downward trend, but apparently of course, this is a big problem that absolutely has to be addressed, right? Of course, this law does seem to leave an exception for family transfers. So typically we're talking about grandpa passes away, the firearms can be transferred, doesn't have to go through a dealer to the sons or beneficiary, the daughters, whoever the case may be, as well as for temporary hunting transfers, whatever that means, presumably if you're going to deer cap and if you want to let a buddy own or, or take possession of a firearm to go hunting with, you don't have to do a background check for that. So presumably it's something like that. And of course, that's the way it is today. And 10 years from now, if this passed, we all know it would probably go someplace much darker. If history, of course, is any lesson on that. Number three, the Enhanced Background Checks Act. Now, we actually did another video talking about how the fact that background checks are broken, linked in the description box below. This seeks to close what is being described as a loophole that allows firearm purchases to be approved if a background check isn't complete by three days, which extends the deadline to 10. What's going on here? You fill out a 4473 when you go to purchase a firearm and you don't get immediately the proceed the approval. 
maybe they have to, for whatever reason, keep looking into the fact that there's a hundred felons that share your exact same name and date of birth, and maybe they even come from surrounding areas or something like that. I'm sorry to all of you Richard Johnsons or something like that out there. It is what it is. I'm not telling you anything new. But the point is that if the ATF doesn't actually complete their background check process, then after three days, it basically allows the dealer to go ahead and to proceed if they want. And of course, subsequent to that, if the ATF figures out, oh, we never should have approved that, or if the FBI, I should say, figures out we never should have approved that, then that's where you get agents at your door saying, yeah, you need to give that back right now. This would extend that deadline to 10 days so the FFL can't immediately proceed if they choose after those three days. Guys, super quickly, show your support for the Second Amendment of Wells, this channel, by clicking like. It's the best way of just taking a moment that doesn't cost you anything, helps us in the YouTube algorithm, and it helps you tell me, as well as the comment section, what kind of videos you want to see us do. So thanks very much. Back to the show. So that's kind of the quick hits roundup on what the Democrats are proposing. But how the heck are they doing this? Well, they're doing it through what's called the discharge petition, and it has been used to actually help gun rights before. So what's the English version of what is a discharge petition before we get into kind of the, the weedy, nerdy parts? The English version is this. Both parties have used this. It's a means of getting a bill out of committee where maybe they die or they don't ever get to see the light of day. And there's some formulas and procedures on how to do that. And that way you can get an up-down vote on the house floor. In a nutshell, that's what it is. You got to remember that the ways that, of course, we get laws is they start off as bills. And before they become bills that get voted on by the House or the Senate, they start off in different committees within the House or the Senate. They have to survive and get through those committees before they get to the vote on the House floor or the Senate floor. And then they crisscross the other House so that they're both voted on before they go up to the president. It's also worthy to note that, of course, most or many state legislatures work the exact same way. But what happens if you're not the majority party and you want to see a bill emerge from committee to be voted? voted on. Because keep in mind, the majority parties control a lot of the agendas and a lot of these subcommittees. Well, originally you only needed one third of the House members in order to do this, in order to exercise a discharge petition. That discharge petition would have then basically ripped it out of the committee by discharging the committee and then giving it the up-down vote. However, in 1931, the rules were changed from requiring 145 votes to 218 votes. That means that you will need an absolute majority of House members. Since this typically comes from the minority party, it will almost always be necessary to flip some majority party members to defect and to sign on to the discharge petition. Now, this used to be a lot easier when signing on to a discharge petition was actually a secret process, at least until the clerk were to read the names aloud and therefore they did that because the measure was passed. But this would allow different members of the majority party to basically perhaps claim one thing to leadership. No, I'm not supporting this, even though they had secretly signed on to it. And therefore, of course, hopefully avoiding payback for their little act of rebellion. Of course, in the alternative, if the discharge petition was successful and their name was then read aloud, well, look, they had a measure of protection and security because after all, they were the majority and it was the speaker and the, the leadership who must have been wrong since they had de facto been proven wrong by the 218 majority against them. This, of course, afforded them, again, that minor moral high ground and hopefully a little bit of protection against reprisals. But that rule regarding secret discharge petitions was likewise amended back in 1993 to make every step of the process public. This allows for leadership to hammer possible flippers with threats and promises, perhaps, to get them not to sign. Incidentally, a discharge petition was threatened and actually came into play concerning the 1986 Firearm Owners Protection Act, sometimes called FOPA. If you want to see a video, by the way, just going through that whole process, as well as the so-called Hughes Amendment that banned the sale of newly manufactured machine guns to civilians, let me know in the comment field below. Guys, if you made it this far in the video, both myself and the algorithm thanks you. Please take that moment if you've not already done so to click like, and I will see you in the next one. Thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. If you enjoyed this one, please feel free to check out some of our other great content, and we'll see you in the next one.